Hello everyone, nice to see you again. This video is going to be a response to Jaronism and his video, Explain It To Me, Volume 1. In his video, Jaronism asks a few questions and requests that the answers not be sarcastic, mean-spirited, or anything of that sort. And we are perfectly willing to comply. One thing we do have to say is that Jaronism has excellent video production value. Take a look at his intro. Welcome to reality. And here is Jaronism's request. So I have just some simple observations here, three or four, that uh, I would like explained if the Earth is a globe, as we've been taught, and gravity sufficiently explains some of the interactions that happen around us and with the planetary bodies, then these answers should be easy. Um, so I'm looking forward to an answer to them. Oh, very good. I'll be happy to respond to the best of my knowledge. All right. So what I've got on the screen now is just a uh, section of the Earth. Let's say that it's um, flat, or you can say it's curved on a ball. It doesn't matter. And on top of that earth, we put a huge rock. And by huge, I mean huge, like a five mile wide by five mile tall rock. So, you know, as high as planes fly. And we take a marble, okay, which is a normal everyday glass marble. And next to the ball, we place it. You tell me what would happen to that marble. It would fall to the ground, correct? That's what I would think. Uh, due to the gravity of the earth, it's going to pull the marble down to the ground. Almost 100% accurate. The marble would fall downward towards the Earth, being the larger body with the larger gravity well, but it would be deflected slightly towards your massive object shown in the picture. Now, is this correct that because the Earth is the larger mass, which means it has a far stronger gravitational pull than the five mile by five mile rock, is it safe to then assume that I am correct in saying that is the reason that the marble falls to the earth? If not, please show me my error, but hopefully we can agree up to this point at least. You're almost correct in those statements. The marble would fall downward towards the earth and not stick to the large object because the earth has the larger gravity well, but while falling it is in fact being affected by two gravity wells, the larger one from the earth and the smaller one from your massive object. Therefore, it would be deflected slightly towards the large object you have on the surface of the Earth as it falls. So, if we can agree on that, I'll move on to the Earth and the Moon. And hopefully we can understand that this picture here is the actual distance and size scaled to the Earth and the Moon. Once we've gotten that, let's take a look at this form here. If the previous points were true, then can you please explain, number one, the moon remaining in orbit of the Earth, and number two, that there's no speed difference in the moon coming and going. So to begin, just like the marble in the previous image, wouldn't the moon work the same way? Meaning when it came around in its orbit of Earth, and it got between the sun and the Earth, wouldn't the sun pull it due to its massive gravity pull versus over the Earth? Why does the moon stay in orbit of the Earth if the sun, the stronger body, the stronger mass pulling gravitationally, why wouldn't that pull the moon right out of our orbit? What you fail to consider while forming that question is that while the moon is orbiting the earth and its orbital speed is what counteracts its attraction to the earth due to the earth's gravity well, it is also in orbit about the sun its orbital speed is roughly that of the Earth. So it is prevented from being dragged off towards the Sun by the same set of forces that keeps the Earth in a relatively stable orbit. Also, on that same note, if you think about it, when the Moon is coming around, say, getting close to a new Moon, uh, as it's entering its orbits, you can take a look at that pink square down there. 
Wouldn't the sun be pulling it and therefore the moon be moving faster than when it is coming out of new moon, as you can see by the blue, square, uh, blue circle there? Wouldn't that make it slower? The answer to this question is closely related to the answer to your first question. It helps if you try and think of the Earth-Moon system not independently, but in fact as a binary planetary system taken from the Sun's standpoint. From this standpoint, the center of gravity between the Earth and the Moon is actually somewhere below the surface of the Earth. And if you consider the two objects orbiting each other around that point, you'll have a much more accurate view of what's going on. Damn it, the movie ended. Let's get that started again. So that's basically part one. Part two has a little bit more to do with shadows. If you have ever taken a ball, shined a flashlight at it, you'll see what kind of shadow comes off of it. And it actually comes out as a cone. And it gets big very fast. So with the distance of the sun and the height and size of the moon, which is only 23% uh, the size of the Earth, 2% of its volume, and 1% of its mass, that the shadow that would be cast on the Earth from the sun during a solar eclipse would be so huge it would wash out the entire Earth, not just one little segment. And also if you turn that and then say the light source on the Earth that would be shined on the moon would be also very, very large, impossible to tell that there was any bit of curvature. And by curvature, I mean the curvature of the so-called shadow on the moon. Now, if we wanted to get two household items and kind of take some tests on this, you could get a basketball, and then measure that out, and know that the moon, which is about the size of a baseball in comparison, is 30 Earth diameters away. So if we added 30 more basketballs in between the first basketball and the baseball, that would be the distance we're looking at. On my example, I only have 15 basketballs, so we'd have to add 15 more and then place the baseball. Then, using a light source, check the shadow that comes from the basketball. It's going to be like a cone heading out towards the baseball and it's going to completely engulf it totally. There will be no shadow of the basketball on the baseball 30 basketballs away. Uh, you're not going to get a curved shadow on the lunar eclipse and you're not going to get a spot shadow on the solar eclipse as we see in reality today. Uh, now you can see on the screen that I just switched. You can do it again with the baseball behind the light source and the basketball 30 basketballs away and you'll also see that that shadow wouldn't work the same as the shadow that we see in reality. Okay, this too should be relatively easy to address. You mentioned the Earth-Moon distance um, when converted to the ratio of baseball to basketball being uh, approximately 30 basketballs apart between the two. Um, okay, being that your average basketball is about 9.55 inches. That means that there would be approximately 286.5 inches between the baseball and the basketball. Now, in order to make your experiment valid, we would have to also accurately represent the distance to the light source. The distance to the light source will determine the divergence of the rays and therefore the magnification of the shadow over the original item. The math to do that is not all that complicated. All we have to do is take the Earth to Moon distance, which is approximately 238,900 miles, and the Earth to Sun distance, which is 92,960,000 miles, and find out the ratio between those two. That ratio happens to be approximately 389.1. Now, we know the distance between your basketball and baseball in your experiment to be approximately 286.5 inches. So if we multiply that by our ratio that we got from the previous calculation, we get that the distance to the light source, which would represent the sun in this case, would be 111,481 inches, approximately. If we divide this by 12 to convert it into feet, we come up with 9,290 feet. That is the distance your light source would have to be in order to make the experiment you describe representative of reality. 
at this distance, you will find that the rays of light coming from the light source are nearly parallel. So when they pass the first object, whether it be your basketball or your baseball, the magnification, when the shadow reaches the other object, will be very small. The shadow will be only slightly larger than the original object. And so that's about it. Pretty easy. Simply explain it to me. That's it. No need for insults. No need for name calling. I am coming to you saying, I do not understand this. I don't know the answer. You all tell me that you do. So please explain it. And hopefully this goes smoothly. If it does, then I have several more questions I'd love to put out there. And we'll get to the truth together. So be kind to each other. Don't lie to each other. And remember to open your mind because there's truth inside. Okay, well that's about it. I hope I've covered all of the questions to Jaronism's satisfaction. If not, I would ask that he please comment below. And I will attempt to clarify. And once again, I would like to thank everyone for watching. Uh, if you enjoy what we're doing here at uh, Science Denier Hall of Shame... Please like and subscribe. See you next time.